Hi, welcome to today's ecology class about energy flow in primary production. I am Divna, so let's start. For the beginning, let's talk about how things actually function on this planet. So we can definitely name the main source of life and energy for Earth. It's definitely sun that drives most of the reactions proceeding the way they do. So the sun is sending its radiation and some part of it reaches the Earth. The, the light that reaches the Earth from the sun comes in the shape of so-called photons. The fate of photons can be double. So one option for photon is to be accepted on Earth as a heat. It's the way of energy that warms up the surface of Earth, dries water cycles, move air masses, and so on. The other option for radiation is to be transmitted in the chemical energy, and it's the plant's ability of photosynthesis to do this. So basically they're transmitting photons as radiation into chemical energy. In more detail, they transmitted it as bonds in carbons, uh, carbohydrates and other carbon-based compounds. And they, this, this matter is basically the main source of all the energy for all the living organisms of our planet. Carbohydrates and other carbon-based matters made by plants are later moved on through all the the processes on planet and into the food chain where the recycle is happening we can talk about this dashed error a bit later but the idea is that the matter is cycling as we talked in the previous presentations all the time through our planet so we can say that the story of energy within an ecosystem is in a large part a story of carbon in the form of organic matter, so the living and dead tissues of plants and then animals. So a bit more about the energy we started the story about. Firstly, to say about chemical reactions we mentioned before. Every chemical reaction can be exothermic or endothermic, depending if it's receiving or sending energy. And that's the story about the dash line. So if the chemical reaction is accepting energy from the outer source, it's called endothermic. And for example, photosynthesis is the example for this. A food chain releasing heat could be considered as exothermic reaction because there's some part of the energy from the process is actually sent away from the energy in the external world. Go back to the previous slide. So um, example for that is burning wood so that when wood burns the energy loss from molecular bonds of the wood equals to energy released as heat so it can also be considered as a thermal energy and uh, when the chemical reaction results in a loss of energy from the system that's it's called exothermic as we mentioned and this is the the example of endothermic uh, reaction as the chemical reaction that is receiving some part of the energy from the ex external world. All this energy flowing within the uh, ecosystems is explained in these two laws of there's a first and a second law of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics is simply saying that energy neither can be made or lost. It can only change shape or place but it cannot disappear or be made regardless of what the transfer and transformation takes place, no gain or loss to total energy occurs. So by the first law of thermodynamics, it states that energy is simply transformed from one form to or place to another without any loss in the total energy. The second law of thermodynamics is explaining this. Second law of thermodynamics is saying that Whatever is happening, what any kind of a reaction, the action, chemical or physical or so on, there is always this waste, so-called waste heat. So whatever is happening, any type of reaction, some part of energy is coding lost from the system by heat that is going back to the atmosphere. These two laws are explaining everything we need to know about energy drives on our planet. Okay, so back to the sun and, it, and its power. So as we mentioned before, the sun is sending some radiation to Earth, but the, the thing is only one part of it is reaching the Earth because most of it is lost in the space and also helpful ozone is protecting us from many harmful 
radiations that are not healthy for living organisms like uv radiation you probably heard about it a b and so on it's absorbed by ozone but the um, important thing to know about radiation is that wavelength is opposite to energy so the the longer the wavelength the wave is carrying less energy and vice versa so compared to all the radiation that is coming from the sun only a small part is actually reaching the earth and the next to all the others that we are not able to detect the visible light is one of the actually the only uh, radiation we can actually visualize so as mentioned before some energies are more useful than others and that's exactly what sunlight is definitely uh, driving the photosynthesis which will be directly the source of all available energy for other organisms on this planet just a bit reminder as you know so uh, carbon dioxide plus, plus water and then this chemical energy is driven, driven by sun radiation that's driving chlorophyll to produce sugars simple sugars and release the oxygen which is basically the equation for life on earth but the important thing to know is that not only chlorophyll is pigment that is able to produce carbohydrates due to the sunlight. Funny thing is that plants we say see the same wavelength as humans, so the story about really different wavelengths coming to the planet, among all of these we have this visible specter. It, uh, the wavelength of it is somewhere between 400 to 700 nanometers and so it's the same light we can detect with our eyes it's the same one that plants react to in the process of photosynthesis so depending on which wavelength in this pan the plant is reacting or its pigments different ones are created so the most known is chlorophyll, but there is chlorophyll A and B and so on, depending on the wavelength they're catching. Then you have carotenoids and phycocyanin and phycoerythrins and so on. And they are always colored the opposite of the wavelength they are catching. So the carotenoids, for example, as you see, are orange but they're actually accepting the wavelength of visible light in the blue part of the specter and so on as we mentioned in the previous slide the photosynthesis depends upon the abs absorption of light by pigments in the leaves and plants so the most important one is the chlorophyll a but there are like several accessory pigments so the all of these are explaining production rate of, of matter to be sent further in food chain. So this is the idea of a food chain. You have a producer, there's oxygen as a byproduct, carbon dioxide is taken, but then you have primary consumers, secondary consumers, decomposers, and so on. So the matter that's produced by a plant is sent further to the food chain. But there are several options of uh, how to consider the production by plants. So we usually take into consideration something that's called net primary productivity or so that's the total rate of photosynthesis or energy assimilated by autotrophs that would be the gross primary productivity so the gross primary productivity is the the first level of production the total amount that the plant is able to produce but when we actually take out the respiration by autotrophs that is definitely losing some of it we end up with the net primary productivity, which is the main consideration when we talk about production of a certain ecosystem. They depend, of course, as we know, the that the NPP is, of course, limited by number of factors like light exposure and water availability and temperature and so on. So different ecosystems have different NPPs. So we can define NPPs as energy available to heterotroph components of the ecosystem. That's the amount of energy available for everybody else but primary producers. As we mentioned, different ecosystems have different production. So this would be the map of uh, terrestrial ecosystems and their productivity. And then we have aquatic ecosystem and their productivity. They are both and usually expressed 
in grams of carbon per meter square per year or also can be described as a amount of chlorophyll. So this net primary production or primary production is the energy available to heterotroph components of the ecosystem and then either herbivores or decomposers eventually consume all the plant productivity but often it's not all used with the same ecosystems. So for example humans or other agents such as winds or water may disperse the primary production of any given ecosystem to another food chain outside the ecosystem. So primary production is not always completely available for the heterotrophs. There are some factors that need to be considered. So some energy in the form of plant material once consumed passes from the body as for example waste product or the energy assimilated part is used as heat for metabolism and also some part needs to be used for so-called maintenance so it's uh, capturing or harvesting food, performing muscular work, keeping up with the tear of animal body and so on. So needs to definitely to consider a few other factors when we talk about uh, the net primary production and what it's actually in practice available for secondary, so-called secondary production, and we'll talk what it is. So you have a plant material minus respiration, you have this NPP, but then you really need to consider the transfer of to other ecosystems, the second law of thermodynamics, the maintenance, and so on. So this is the story of maintenance, keeping up the work of the body muscles, or food chase, or picking food, or fighting for your territory, and so on, what everyday work demands from you. But then when you exclude all of that, you get the secondary production, and that's actually the energy left over from maintenance and respiration, and that the secondary production actually goes into production, so including uh, growth of new tissues, and the production of young. So this is the story about it caterpillar eating plant material some most of it is going as a byproduct of the metabolism other part is going to the cellular respiration and heat loss and then there is a part that is going to the growth of the animal itself forming new tissues and the size of its body definitely the that's the story about the secondary production the other option is taking care of young so re reproduction and uh, offspring maintenance. Second reproductivity is greatest when the birth rate of population and the growth rate of individuals are the high. Okay, that's it for today. Talk to you in the next presentations. Bye.